Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar forum of what can the humanities tell us about COVID-19. This forum emerged from a discussion I had with Professor Kelly Fielding when we realised that some of our colleagues in the humanities space at UQ and elsewhere were doing exciting work at the nexus of how the pandemic, the pandemic was affecting people's lives in Australia and elsewhere. We are excited to now host a lineup of research projects from across the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of Queensland. We have 125 people registered to attend today, which is a fantastic turnout. Could I ask you to turn off your Zoom microphones, please, um, as you enter, uh, to ensure we have the best possible experience during the next two hours. To open the forum and offer an, an acknowledgement to country, we're very pleased to welcome the Deputy Executive Dean of the Faculty, Professor Greg Marston. Thanks very much, Greg. Thank you, Jane, uh, and welcome everyone uh, to this webinar, which I'm very much looking forward to taking part in and listening to the wonderful presentations on the exciting research that's happening in the humanities. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional uh, owners and custodianship of the various lands on which we meet today. Uh, we pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise the valuable contribution to Australia and global society. Linked to this, I mean, part of the purpose of today is analysing what forms of knowledge and what voices get privileged and amplified in crisis talk. As in the bushfire and the drought crisis that preceded the health pandemic, there is much that can be learned from First Nations people about how to better manage our relationship to country, about reciprocity, and about respecting the limits of our expertise. Similarly, in terms of the humanities, they can help us identify the best parts of society that were revealed during the pandemic, such as the many moments of solidarity and selflessness, but also how to address the inequities and the cleavages that were exposed by the pandemic. And really the best pieces that I've read on the, what the pandemic can teach us have been penned by novelists, performing artists, historians. This is where I go in terms of inspiration and nourishment to think better about how we might build back fairer and greener. So what I do know is that we need more than the voices of the economists and the corporate se sector mapping out a future path. Without listening to our humanists, our social scientists, our artists, our citizens, and our diverse communities in this country, we will find ourselves reverting to habits and ways of being that are not healthy or productive. And we don't need a snapback. In the words of Billy Bragg, we are waiting for the great leap forwards. But when we look into our own backyard and across the globe, we also know that many people are done waiting. So with some sense of urgency, this webinar presenters during the course of this morning will seek to address one core question. How might the humanities help society as it transitions forward? I'm very much looking forward to the presentations as I said, as they outline some of the guideposts that we need to navigate a path towards a possible future rather than an all too predictable future. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Kelly Fielding from the School of Communication and Arts, who's going to MC the forum. Thank you very much. And thanks very much, Greg and, uh, and Jane. Uh, it's, it is, uh, I'm really looking forward to the forum today. I think uh, we have an amazing lineup. Uh, it's gonna be super interesting. And so what I'd like to do is just tell you a little bit about how it's actually going to run. So. Uh, we have uh, broken those presentations, presentations into three broad themes. We have a theme about social media, about public communication, and about uh, an in, and with an industry focus. Now, within each of those themes, um, in the social media and the public com communication themes, there are three speakers. And we're going to, within each theme, um, the speakers will present back to back and then we'll have time for questions um, at the end of, the, uh, of each of the, not each of the speakers, but at the end of the, uh, all of the speakers. Uh, and so um, please do, do feel free to um, type your questions and your comments uh, into the Q&A. You'll see the little, uh, if you hover down the bottom of your screen for anyone who's not uh, really uh, highly familiar with uh, Zoom, if you hover down the bottom of your screen, you'll see the Q&A um, icon and you can click on that and you can type your questions and comments either during the talks or during the Q&A session. Uh, <clears throat> so I think that 
that uh, we've already uh, talked about the, the fact that uh, everyone's muted unless uh, uh, we uh, need people to talk, of course. Um, and so I'm um, really looking forward to hearing the presentations and to hear your questions and comments about the presentations. And without any further ado, I'm going to uh, hand over to uh, Dr. Francisca Wida and Dr. Cedric Courtois, who are from the School of Communication and Arts, who will be talking about between caution and reassurance, government's COVID-19 communication on Twitter. Um, take it away, uh, Francisca and Cedric. Okay, thank you so much, Kelly, for the introduction. And um, we are really, really happy and looking forward to share some ideas, some results, some like inspirational thoughts with you. Um, so I'm sharing my screen now with you. And um, um, yeah, and I would like to invite you to just follow a few thoughts that we had at the beginning um, when Cedric and I started to talk about COVID-19, what is happening, who's communicating where, and um, somehow what are the effects of all this kind of communication that we can observe from our perspective. Um, so just to give you a quick introduction into where we're coming from. Um, so COVID-19 challenged all governments and um, what we heard over the past four months and um, past year month was mostly about the big war, the big war against the virus. So uh, the French Prime Minister Macron said our nation is at war with an invisible enemy and Boris Johnson from the UK pretty much in the same um, tone as he said, we must act like any wartime government. There were a few exceptions, and um, so it's probably um, <laughs> not only because I'm from Germany, but um, I have to mention that Angela Merkel did a pretty good job in not using these war and fight metaphors. She um, talked about like the current situation as a real test, as um, like we're in serious times and a dramatic crisis. Um, we're facing this gigantic challenge. However, um, uh, it's a long distance run. She never used the war metaphor, but this is an exception. So what we can see from the studies that Cedric and I are doing kind of in parallel to what we're presenting here is that, um, as you see in this graph, this war metaphor, this kind of fighting against the virus is a very strong image, is a very strong communication frame that is used in public discourses and in governmental communication um, mainly. So this enemy, that attacks us, this is a very strong, strong image. And um, so this is where we started kind of saying, oh, well, so the governments are putting so much effort into all this communication and they're using various channels to talk about this pandemic, um, which is this massive public health outbreak. And um, so they think they are um, choosing pretty much um, maybe similar or maybe different communication strategies and response strategies to this global crisis. Um, we know, and the World Health Organization as well, framed this not only as a pandemic, but as an infodemic, um, especially when we look at social media. So this is how, why we got more and more interested into those governmental communication using Twitter, using social media as a beautiful communication space that is really nice to look at and that has quite an influence then on the media again. Um, what we kind of developed as a framework is that there is a kind of juxtaposition between political communication and health communication in this pandemic situation, meaning a kind of like tension um, or line of conflict between communication that is more like um, trying to enable security, trying to create a secure and abundant a reassured environment versus health communication in this pandemic, which is definitely about this attack, about this massive threat, about insecurity and caution that is required. So this is where we really say, okay, this juxtaposition is really interesting. And um, we're wondering if um, governments communicate quite differently. So we started with um, three questions uh, that are basically about what are the major topics that are communicated? What is the um, supporting kind of language that um, has been used or presented by government communication on Twitter, both by government leaders and health officials, so the health ministries and the health officials during the first six months of the pandemic, so from January to, till um, the end of May. 
Um, so uh, the next question that we said, like, oh, so if we take this, like, if we look at this larger time frame, so what might be the progression of these topics and themes that we might be able to locate in this Twitter communication space? And complementary to that, what is like, how are these topics and themes regionally distributed from a global perspective? Um, with our background, we thought we definitely have to add a fourth question, which um, is uh, how, um, or where we thought we have to bring in some other variables or some other factors that help us to, yeah, to learn about the differences between the countries. We said, okay, why don't we take a GDP and the universal healthcare status, so meaning the infrastructure that is actually there to cope with this crisis as variables and ask about like, how does this maybe influence the governmental communication on Twitter in this pandemic situation? And I'm handing over to Cedric now who will tell you a bit more, about more our methodology. Okay, hello everyone. Um, so what we did is we used Twitter as an indication of um, government communication. So that's an underlying assumption. Um, we have a global reach. So what we did is we started from a list of all affected countries sourced from the um, WHO and then looked for their um, government leadership. So prime minister, um, president, vice president, whatever is relevant. Um, their Twitter handles and their tweets, but also the Minister of Health and the official health department. There was a standardized procedure to do that. And um, all these tweets were harvested from um, the beginning of January uh, until um, May. So next slide, please. And then we had a massive corpus of tweets coming from these sources um, scattered all over the world. So we had different languages. So the first step we had to do in preparing the data for um, actual analysis was to translate it. Uh, we used uh, Google Translate to do that. Then there was an extensive procedure of um, cleaning, preparing the text to, um, to um, have it analyzed um, in, in, in the later um, run. We used sentiment analysis to um, look at um, the polarity and the subjectivity of um, these tweets. But most important, we used topic modeling to um, look at the distinct themes that are in that corpus of text, in that corpus of tweets. So um, topic modeling, you could see that as um, a way of clustering um, words, coherently clustering words that um, reflect themes that are in the tweets. Now, that's not the only thing we, um, as Francisca mentioned, we enriched those data further with um, getting data on universal health coverage per country from the um, WHO, the GDP from the World Bank, and the democracy index for each country um, from the, um, the Economist. So altogether, that boiled down after cleaning um, to a corpus of over 60,000 tweets um, nested in 324 Twitter handles, so um, 324 Twitter accounts, over 139 countries. So the most important part of the analysis is, okay, what kind of themes do we get there um, in uh, these, these, um, these uh, tweets? And uh, we found an ideal number of um, 10 topics. Some of these topics are business as usual. Um, so it would be about international celebration, um, economic support and international relations. And we saw that during the pandemic, these topics, they, they lost their prominence. And other topics that are dominantly COVID related, they gained in, um, in prominence. For example, um, talk about confirmed cases, which is exemplified by wording such as case test, corona confirmed, number of patients, but also preventive measures by the government, but also um, about what an individual could do. For example, um, home, spread, protect, follow, stay, prevent people, important hand mask. These are, um, well, indications of, um, yeah, calling people to um, wear a mask, um, yeah, practice basic hygiene in terms of washing hands uh, and so on. And, and of course, um, self-isolate when, when that's necessary. Next slide. Francisca, yeah, thank you. Um, so, 
there was a lot in there yeah. because we don't only have the, the topics, we also modeled the different pathways for um, different countries. Um, also, again, taking into account those different variables, GDP, universal health coverage, and um, their democratic performance. So what we noticed, if we have to boil it down to just one slide, because there's much to appreciate in the study, but one slide would say, the identified teams, as we saw them, these 10 teams, they um, strongly follow the tide of the pandemic per country. So when cases, confirmed cases and death toll increases, then the intensity of talking about COVID in a certain way, it increases. But there are distinct differences between countries because um, what we noticed generally all over the world is that countries who don't have the infrastructure um, they are lower in GDP, lower in universal health care, and even their democratic performance is less than ideal. They tend to talk about the pandemic in a different way. They highlight, for example, support and solidarity, and they divert part of the responsibility to um, the individual. So they would highlight individual preventive measures more than, um, for example, the readiness um, of their infrastructure, as in, we've got the doctors, we've got the hospitals to take care of this pandemic. So um, there's a lot of communality all over the world, but then again, there's also a lot of difference and that difference can be explained on a country level. Okay, so this, that's pretty much it. And we're really looking forward to your questions and your like uh, continuing conversation about how much the actually, like the actual health infrastructure state and the economic stability and democracy as like really important factor apparently um influence governmental communication and so not only political communication in this specific situation but health communication as well and um, how can we further like what are future learnings for this kind of risk much responsibility to individuals in much responsibility is kind of allocated to the government to and this is a very question for scholars so um, we're ready to any kind of further chats and conversation all right well thank you so much uh, francisca and uh, cedric uh for a really, uh, yeah, amazing talk. Um, I'm going to, uh, they've, uh, we're running exactly on time, I think at the moment, which is, you know, absolutely unheard of. But um, uh, in the interest of keeping us on time, I'm going to now hand over to uh, uh, Professor Michael Hoare and uh, Dr. Martin Schweinberger, apologies for any mispronunciations, um, who are both from the School of Languages and Cultures, um, and they're going to talk about a real-time corpus-based analysis of responses to COVID-19 in the Australian Twitter sphere. So I think we're continuing on with our social media and Twitter uh, analysis of uh, COVID-19 communication. Uh, I'll hand over to you now, Michael and uh, Martin. Thank you. Um, so uh, what we're focusing on here is uh, essentially response analysis. Uh, we're interested in what um, essentially the general public, uh, uh, how they are talking about COVID-19. Um, and we're focused particularly, rather than um, looking at uh, trying to look at the whole world, um, we're focused in on what Australians have been saying about COVID-19 and how that has changed over time. Um, it's important to remember when we first heard the news about COVID, uh, it was a lot of focus on this being a problem in China. Um, and over time in late January, early February, this is, was essentially seen as a Chinese problem. Um, then it started spreading into Europe and the discourse started to change. And then of course it started hitting Australia in March. And what we're interested in tracing is how how the discourse changed over time. Uh, this has quite important implications. If, if you're trying to understand the impact of policy and public communications around COVID, uh, we know right now in Victoria, there are issues uh, with people uh, complying with physical distancing uh, to varying degrees. Um, and to try to tap into whether the populace is taking messaging seriously, 
um, we, we really need to be able to do this quickly because this has uh, quite significant public health implications. Um, so what is one of the ways uh, in which we could do this? Um, there's a fabulous resource um, which has been collected by colleagues at QT over a number of years now. It's called the Australian Twitter Corpus. Um, and it really offers a big data perspective into what the populace uh, are talking about. There's approximately four and a half million users of Twitter in Australia. That's about 18% of the population who, who apparently use it to varying degrees. Um, so that gives you a, a massive population to be drawing from. Um, and when we started uh, looking at this question, what we're interested in is both topics, um, uh, Emily, can you uh, switch to the next slide? Um, we were interested both in the, in the topics, what people are, are talking about in relation to COVID, um, and that can vary from things, uh, you know, toilet paper was a, a big issue, running out of pasta, or should I wear a mask, all these kind of topics, and then also um, stance. Um, so in linguistics, we call it stance, in computer science, it's called sentiment. But essentially what that relates to is both um, stance can be a positive or negative, you think something is good or bad, but it's also whether you take something seriously or you don't take it seriously, right? These are two really important aspects of stance or sentiment. Um, so if, if I give you an example, Trump is the greatest US president since Lincoln. Uh, it could be a possible tweet that someone might send. Um, that, that, uh, the topic there, of course, is uh, the presidency in the US and uh, particularly Donald Trump. Um, the stance, uh, on one hand, it's a positive sentiment being expressed. Um, I'm not sure how many of us would think that is a serious one. Uh, it could very well be a ironic, sarcastic, playful, joking, and so on. So looking at both those aspects is really important in, uh, from our perspective. And we're also interested in both the topics and how those stances changed over time uh, from, from that period early on uh, up until uh, later in the, in the pandemic. So I'll hand across to Martin to go into more detail. Right. So what we did to find out about the different phases and the shifts in stance uh, is we um, basically took two subcorpora, one corpus of tweets from um, uh, 2019 and one corpus from January 2020 to late April 2020, so pretty much the, the same phase that previous project used. Um, and as Michael said, the data was collected by the Digital Observatory. Um, as of now, we're only using 1% of the entire data uh, that we will have access to once um, the project is fully going. But even this 1% is about 21 million words or 80, um, 870,000 tweets, so it's quite big. Uh, we then and then basically uh, used a classifier to determine which tweets were related to COVID and which were non-COVID related. Um, to basically not only find tweets that mention COVID, but you have lots of topics that are associated with, uh, associated with uh, COVID where COVID is not even mentioned, right? So for example, when someone says, well, I lost my job and now I'm a job keeper, that's related to COVID, but COVID doesn't have to be mentioned. So, so I built a classifier. Then I used uh, changes in frequencies of these different um, um, of words within the COVID tweets to come up with different phases, right? So we had a periodization of the, of the data set. And then within each period, we want to use, uh, top, uh, we use topic modeling to identify different topics that are relevant within each of the phases. Um, and then later on, what we're going to do is we're going to apply sentiment analysis, but also qualitative analysis, where we uh, check what people are talking about and how their um, stance and sentiments shift over time and how the different phases differ. So just to give you an impression, uh, just looking at some keywords, um, this is how Twitter unfolded, uh, how COVID uh, unfolded on Twitter. So you see that beginning of January, there's not very much discourse around it. Then you see a spike coming up uh, around end of January. Uh, that basically people started talking about uh, China and COVID in China. Uh, in China. Then you had basically um, a phase where everything calmed down a little bit, and then you have the big hit where uh, COVID hit Australia, and then you have all sorts of different issues that pop up, like isolation, lockdown, uh, toilet paper flatten the curve, so all these different topics. 
Now, when we look at um, some keywords, you see that the different phases actually uh, are quite distinct. For example, here again in phase four, uh, you can see that there's a spike in China related tweets within the um, um, COVID uh, Twitters. Then you also see something here, which is quite interesting. So you have flattening the curve, which slightly precedes, for example, the social distancing and the lockdown. So basically people made, uh, you, you talked about getting ready for the lockdown, uh, lockdown or I mean to prevent it by talking about what can be done like social distancing. And then it hit, and at the very end, you see that now um, issues related to the economy uh, become more important again. So there's a drastic increase, and again, also topics related to China increase again. Now, when we look at different periods, you see some changes in the things that people talk about in the, in the so-called topics uh, that were detected by the topic modeling. And um, you see that, for example, um, actually the Scott Morrison, Prime Minister related focus, which we see um, in the middle here, was actually quite prominent at the very beginning, still due to the, um, to the bushfires probably, but then actually became less and less important over time as the um, uh, crisis progressed, which is quite interesting, I, I think. Um, you also have, of course, the focus on the tests uh, and confirmed deaths when the um, COVID epidemic was in full swing, right? So you basically uh, see these changes in, when, in what people talk about in different phases, and that was interesting to us. So that was basically our approach um, to not tap into what is the COVID discourse about in general, but what different phases are there, uh, what topics are related to different phases, and how did the sentiment shift? And as the project will continue, we'll find out more about that. So thank you very much. And yeah. Yeah, for questions. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Martin and Michael, uh, and, and especially for, again, keeping to time. Um, so we'll go straight on to uh, Associate Professor Adriana Tick, um, whose uh, presentation is called The Flight of Black Swans, Stress Testing the Digital Society. So I'll hand over to you now, uh, Adrian. Thank you. I'm just going to speak um, from an introduction um, that I have written for the um, two issues of Media International Australia that I've been um, editing, which covers a vast range of, of topics in communication. And I can't talk about all of them, but I'm just going to address a kind of question about the digital. Okay, I'll work from paper, I can't see my screen. So, baked into the social logics of our digital architecture is a kind of triad of free speech, mass surveillance and predictive calculus. They're all designed to provide a universal public sphere, and a mechanism for managerial control. And consequently, uh, as a BBC commentator observed, we thought this digital technology would keep us safe. This being the implicit trade-off between intrusive communication tech and personal well-being. But our awareness of the dangers of this approach have been growing and they've become particularly acute in the circumstances that we now face. And despite you know, long-standing efforts to naturalise the affordances of the digital, um, we have to recognise that our digital architecture has been effectively shaped by a series of crises in this century. And this series of seemingly black swan events at the global scale were all eminently predictable in nature, uh, but not in their specific timing. 9-11, which legitimised the implementation of mass surveillance and novel data sharing relationships between tech companies and state agencies. The GFC, that drew our attention to the systemic risks created by velocity and complexity, fueling massive investments in predictive analysis. And now the global pandemic of COVID-19 coronavirus, spreading rapidly across a world of unprecedented mobility. Each of these presented wicked problems that appear to require complex responses using the preeminent technology of our time. There was much fanfare, of course, a decade ago surrounding Google flu trends, its claimed capacity to predict outbreaks of disease, by drawing upon its panoptic view of search terms, identifying epidemiological trends through pattern recognition. But things went quiet as it became apparent that recording one outbreak in detail through proxy inputs doesn't provide predictive capacity. And parallel efforts to predict novel disease outbreaks ran up against the sheer volume of virological organisms, the multiple variables involved in zoonotic transfer, and in human transmission and disease. 
So by 2017, it was conceded that such events were both inevitable and unpredictable. And that dilemma strikes at the heart of an ascendant numerological privilege. And so we, by and large, chose to ignore that lesson. But instead, in the first three months of the current pandemic, data modeling became the only authoritative influence on policymakers, even where such work had to be based on limited knowledge of the pathogen. So Imperial College London, who raised the alarm early in January, were on the strength of their reputation, the first people outside of Asia, to cut through the do not be alarmed messaging and to start saving lives. And the ICL data was based upon many early assumptions about the virus, many of which turned out to be false. But even without reliable inputs, the deductive capacity of human beings had greater utility than predictive technology. With the proviso that was only given attention when it was dressed up in numbers. And so the lesson to be learned from our failure is that prediction can never be a substitute for preparation. It's much more important to have the necessary procedures and stockpiles than predict the day of an event. But prediction is not the only potential of digital surveillance. In less than two decades, mobile architecture, device addiction, bureaucratic imposition have all given us the most extensive regime of surveillance in history. And that in itself predisposed the trace, test and isolate doctrine that was widely touted as the smart alternative to welding people inside buildings. Singapore, with its much envied technocratic regime, well-disciplined population, was a natural leader in developing mobile-based tracking. But their trace together software failed to prevent an outbreak of coronavirus, not only because the Bluetooth environment was not conducive to this repurposing, but because it was predicated upon a certain normative Singaporean, not on the crowded and impoverished transient population that the government had itself conspired to render invisible. Before that became apparent, other governments latched onto the promise that perpetual contact tracing would allow an acceptable risk environment for everyday economic life to continue, thereby bolstering the surrender and suppress doctrine favoured by economic managers. But by that time, or by the time that this digitally enabled resumption of normality was implemented, the UK had to concede their app did not work, while Australia has had to adjust quickly to the evident failure of the COVID safe sunscreen in Melbourne. Even in the origin case in China, the tragedy in Wuhan was a powerful reminder that vast investments in techno-authoritarianism would have been far better spent on addressing basic failures in public hygiene and sanitation. And so the lesson here is that controlling a virus is not like controlling people, principally because a virus does not carry a phone. Nonetheless, the multi-purpose architecture of our media systems puts communication at the centre of government, if not education policy. And one negative consequence is that our managerial culture is overly dependent on data-driven decision-making and predisposed towards an app-based solution for everything. In the public domain, the echo chambers of social media platforms are really fundamentally different from the mass media systems through which our response to the AIDS pandemic was enacted. In that case, a dire and officially orchestrated warning was broadcast throughout society with only minimal interference from gainsayers and bigots. There was institutional consensus amongst public health professionals, journalists and politicians. But by contrast, the current pandemic has been characterized by a bewilderment of mixed messaging, counter arguments, motivated activism, geopolitical conflicts and conspiracy theories. And the latter range from the officially sanctioned notions of laboratory release to bizarre claims around 5G, an irrational insistence by so many that the coronavirus is not dangerous or does not even exist. And the libertarian ethos of free speech, participatory journalism models and the emergent modes of political populism enabled by social media have then all shaped the temper of social responses to the pandemic. And for its part, public health communication has been bedeviled by political constraints and incomplete or incorrect advice. Consequently, the return of public experts to the press podium in March has been followed by a descent into vilification, partisan politics, and most critically, denial. Denial is a natural human response to complex and intangible threats, and even more so to something that disrupts the pattern of normality through which our life courses are perceived. Thus, having 
derided the cancel culture of which he is an exemplar. The US president has tweeted the demise of coronavirus dozens of times since February. But the virus itself, unfortunately, remains impervious to being blocked from anyone else's reality. And the lesson here is that ignorance shares many characteristics of a viral disease. And the practical question then is what doctors of communication can do about that. Do we control that virus or does it control us? So in this talk, I've sketched the COVID-19 pandemic as a crisis for the very ethos of digital society, where historical experience is proving more instructive than futuristic prediction, where social consensus has proved more effective than automated surveillance, and where decentralized communication is amplifying hysteria. So outside of virology then, communication may well prove to be the most central field of expertise in countering this pandemic. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Adrian. Um, and uh, uh, I should just say that I, I forgot to mention that Adrian's from the Institute for Advanced Studies in Humanities. So uh, apologies, uh, but thank you for a great talk. So um, they, uh, that concludes the first theme of our uh, uh, our forum today uh, with the focus on social media. So I really do invite you to send through your questions and comments. Questions, of course, uh, are really uh, very welcome. Uh, and while I'm waiting uh, for those to come through, I thought I would invite um, the first, uh, uh, Cedric and Francisco, and then Martin and Michael in the first instance, to just maybe talk to us really briefly about what comes next for the research. Because I can see with both of those talks where there's an, um, you know, there's data being collected that uh, there's a lot of data and there's more analysis and, and thinking to go into it. And so it'd be great for you to uh, give us a little bit of a, uh, a sense of where you plan to go to next with that, uh, with those projects. Maybe Francisco and um, Cedric, you could start. Yep, sure. So I think there are two, like, I, um, I'm happy for you, Cedric, to, to add what I'm, um, to what I'm saying. Uh, just a quick comment. I think there are two pathways we're following. One pathway is definitely um, kind of ongoing quantitative perspective on really kind of monitoring and mapping what is happening in this um, Twitter communication sphere. It is really relevant and it's really interesting, especially from a strategic communication point of view as well. Um, the other pathway we are probably, um, um, I mentioned it at the beginning of the presentation is, um, and this is, might link our study quite nicely to the second presentation is, um, what are like frames, what are metaphors, what are um, those some um, language bits and bytes that are used um, and what can we learn by um, observing them. And, and, and um, as Adrian just said at the end of the, his presentation, communication is essential here. here. Um, and it's, um, uh, I think, can contribute nicely um, from both perspectives, like more like a qualitative and quantitative perspective. But Cedric. Uh, yeah, <laughs> of course. Where are we yeah. going to? <laughs> yeah. Um, what we did right now was a snapshot. So from January until May, that was a sense of urgency. That's when everybody recognized that there was a big problem that needed to be addressed. What we see right now is that there is um, a prudent shift towards reopening economic um, factors take prominence again, but at different paces. So um, I think that it would be valuable to keep track of the government communication. And my prediction would be that there would be a lot of variants in there that would be explained by um, different reopening strategies, but also the success of those reopening strategies. And um, yeah, I think there will be even more pressure of the political communication vis-a-vis um, -vis the, the health communication there. So there's a lot to be, uh, to be checked and seen. And, uh, Michael and Martin, did you want to uh, uh, say a little bit about where you're going to next with yours? Um, we have some other questions coming in. So, so if you want to be brief, that's great. Right. So um, basically we're still working on uh, getting the architecture of the code together. So I'm still in, in the process of programming essentially the analysis. Then of course we'll get the entire data set, not just the 1% on which we're working right now. And then we'll also basically um, improve the analysis in terms of really um, having fixed periods, which is kind of low volatile at the moment. 
and also implement all the um, sentiment analysis that will come. And then we'll also do the uh, qu uh, qualitative inspection. But first, our focus at the moment is still the uh, getting the programming architecture, the analysis in order. Okay, great. And, and so, Adrian, I haven't forgotten you, but uh, we'll just go to a couple of questions where people wanted some specific, specifics um, about the Twitter analysis. So there's one question here that says, uh, in your research, what kinds, topics, styles of communication on social media from official sources um, are that are correlated with effective suppression of the pandemic? And what are the relationships between these styles of com communication with indices like democracy index, GDP? So I think this is something that Francisca and Cedric um, addressed, but I'm not sure, Martin and Michael, if you've got um, uh, some thoughts. I've got a, I've got a uh, shake. Uh, shaking of heads so maybe this is a question uh, specifically for Francisca and Cedric unless you want to chime in there uh, Michael and Martin. Um, yeah so if we talk about suppression in terms of um, denying or downplaying um, the severity of the pandemic um, there are definitely uh, differences and I would say that they are most pronounced in um, the regions that we might expect like North America, the USA in particular, but also maybe yes, Brazil. I should check that last one uh, individually, but for the US it's definitely a pattern that there is more talk about social support, about um, topics that are not immediately related to the capacity and the severity of the pandemic. Okay, and, and there was a quick question about how many languages did you have to end up translating to do that global analysis? I can't say um, straight from the cuff. I, I need to check that, but... Um, a lot. A lot, a <laughs> lot. <laughs> okay. And for both of the uh, Twitter talks, um, there's a question about whether fake accounts get taken into consideration um, in the data mining. So how do you deal with that sort of data? I think if this is a data cleaning kind of issue, is it just create noise in the data or is there a way that you can try to get rid of those fake accounts? Well, I can say for the, the government's um, Twitter study that fake accounts weren't really an issue because we looked for the official accounts of um, these uh, government of officials. So um, that was manually done. So there was a check in the middle whether um, it actually made sense, whether that account was not some kind of a satiric account the, that imitates a government official, but rather is the actual government official. And Martin and Michael, um, what uh, what do you do in terms of that, that issue? We don't. So uh, essentially, I think it's um, what we have in terms of data is the date when a tweet was published and uh, the text of the tweet and everything else is basically hidden from us. Um, that is something or that's the data what it looks like when you get it from Digital Observatory. Um, one, one problem I have is if we screen for fake accounts, I think that actually we would delete many, many, many uh, real accounts. Mm -hmm. So I think it's actually a serious uh, problem that if you want to weed out fake accounts, you actually end up deleting actual data. Okay, um, that's great. Look, I, I just want to go back to Adrian though, because I think um, uh, many of the um, of what he, much of what he said was very thought provoking. Um, but there was something that jumped out at what you, uh, what you said um, uh, about perhaps the historical experience being better at the foreca data forecasting, Adrian. Could you just say a little bit more about that um, uh, just before we moved on to the next session? Because um, I, I thought that was a really interesting and maybe uh, provocative um, uh, comment, um, which I hope I haven't misunderstood. No, I think it's I think it's important, and I think this comes from, in a sense, the, the, the really fine-grained data that we're producing now around this around this pandemic is going to provide us with a, with a wealth of, of knowledge and means to tackle things in the future. But because of the rapid speed at which it moves, of course, the, our responses have to be driven retrospectively as well. So when much of this was breaking out, I was in Asia, and of course, it was people's experiences of SARS the first time people's memories in Bombay of the Spanish flu that were being talked about as the pandemic was bearing down upon us. And if you look back, there's actually a lot of historical information around that pandemic, which has been kind of brought out and put to use here in really important ways. And it's surprising just how much information was recorded about that event, which was then seemingly kind of forgotten in the history of the 20th century, but has now kind of come back to inform us. So I think that that 
is also quite interesting uh, and, worth, and worth thinking about. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. Um, and, you know, I think there's some, some discussion about the countries that have gone through sort of, you know, like MERS or SARS was being so much, you know, better equipped because they've got that, the kind of um, uh, settings in place. Look, um, they, they were three great talks. Um, thank you so much. Um, in the interest of keeping to time, um, we are running a little bit behind time. I, I'm going to have to forge ahead with the, uh, the next um, theme. So, but I just, do want to thank thank everybody again for um, for three really uh, interesting and thought provoking talks. So our next theme, which is about public communication, uh, let me uh, start by introducing um, the first speakers, uh, uh, Associate Professor Elizabeth Stevens, who's from the uh, Institute for Advanced Studies in Humanities, um, and uh, <coughs> Dr. Karen Selberg from the uh, School of Philosophical and Historical Aqu Inquiry. We're gonna be talking about medical humanities and public health messaging. I'll hand over to you now. Okay, hey, hello. I'm just gonna uh, get my share screen up. Um, see? Uh, there. Um, Okay, so um, I'm going to start off uh, my little Elizabeth's uh, little talk by uh, talking about the Medical Humanities Research Network that we're running together with, uh, with Rebecca Lush from the medical faculty. And uh, Elizabeth and I will then contextualize this with some of the research we're currently doing in relation to public health campaigns during the COVID-19 crisis. We're finding that medical humanities methodologies um, are more important than ever in this current climate and we're thus working to expand the medical humanities uh, network beyond UQ. Um, medical humanities is quite a new kind of uh, uh, transdisciplinary space and as it's uh, emerged throughout the world uh, in the last 15 years or so, we've seen two distinct trends you either get uh, a lot of medical humanities looking uh, specifically on clinical practice. And in, in, these kind of, in this type of medical humanities, you get humanities approaches introduced to uh, medical scholars and practitioners as a means of uh, producing more humane doctors. And on the other side of the fence, um, you get um, a lot of humanity scholars producing work, uh, critiquing and problematizing medical ideology and practice. Uh, but it's generally uh, directed only uh, towards other humanities scholars. For us, uh, the most productive way to approach the medical humanities lies somewhere between these two. We're actively working to form a medical humanities research in conversation and collaboration with medical practitioners. So to give you an example of uh, how this would be productive, I'm going to turn to some of my current research on the COVID crisis in Sweden. Um, I've just re returned from Sweden actually only a couple of days ago, so I'm currently in hotel quarantine. And um, as you've possibly heard, because it's been reported throughout the world, Sweden made the decision to, to take a no lockdown approach to the pandemic, giving out guidelines rather than enforced rules. And it's one of the few countries uh, that, uh, that have not used those wartime analogies that we talked about earlier. I'm particularly interested in the emphasis on individual and social agency in this approach, um, and which is presented as, as, as an alternative to control. The idea is that, the people should that people should take their own responsibility and feel ownership over the response. I don't have time to go into the various pros and cons of the Swedish model, and there are plenty of both. But in my opinion, one of the biggest problems with the response is that it, it's been led entirely by, by epidemiologists and scientists focused on public health. And they are, they are still the people who conduct the daily reporting. But in building this agential re approach, they've, uh, they refuse to impose any measures that are not clearly evidence-based and proven to work according to the strict uh, epidemiolo epidemiolo epidemiological disciplinary perimeters. And one such measure is the wearing of masks, which they said uh, was not proven to have any noticeable effect and could potentially increase risk of contagion if used incorrectly. A number of humanity scholars in Sweden, including myself, have spoken up to argue that this scientific approach to the wearing of masks completely ignores uh, the social, cultural and psychological signification of it. Uh, a mask is a sign of solidarity, awareness, 
and indeed even agency or ownership of the situation. In taking an approach to the crisis um, that, um, uh, that, relies, uh, on, in, that relies on individual responsibility, Sweden still failed to take account of humanity's work on these concepts. There should have been a conversation between scientists and Haas scholars working together con to conceptualize how social and cultural agency functions. And now I'm gonna hand over to Elizabeth. classic mistake of forgetting to unmute myself. Emily, I think, is going to uh, reshare our screen here. So I will just launch uh, straight in while waiting for the screen to come up. So hopefully it will. So I'm going to look at a different kind of interface between the medical sciences and the humanities in my part of our presentation, in which we approach the pandemic as an experience and not just as an event, as a crisis, not just of public health, as Karen's just indicated, but also of something more nebulous, our capacity to make sense of the world. So if we go to the next slide, we can see this um, amply demonstrated in the proliferation of memes and jokes about the disordering of time in particular um, in relation to the pandemic um, and of the sort of upending of the structures of everyday life. So we see here a kind of derangement of the order of things where a calendar for 2020 has all the middle months mushed together or my personal favorite next week has been exhausting, these mixing up of times. If we go to the next um, slide as well, um, we can see here a sense that anything is possible in the sphere of the pandemic, that, that the usual order of things has been completely disrupted um, and anything is possible to um, happen. So what next is the thing that we no longer dare to ask ourselves um, about the time of the pandemic? But I'm interested in a prolific um, of a discursive proliferation that's occurred as a direct consequence of this, which we see in the next slide, which is associated with this sense of the cliched, uh, unprecedented nature of the pandemic, an intense anxiety about the status of normal life. Um, so we see in these fairly early headlines, these are all headlines um, gathered from the start of the pandemic, um, the, the repetition of when are we going back to normal? When will things get back to normal? When can we return to normal? Then if we look in the next slide, we see in the middle of the, the pandemic, so I'm looking the middle as of now, I'm looking at headlines here from a couple of months ago, um, asking about whether we are in fact in a new normal and what this is going to look and feel like. And then if we go to the third slide, most of which are more recent, um, we see something else that perhaps we're moving beyond what we used to understand as normal um, and that we shan't ever go back um, to the normal. Um, and in fact, a, a lot of criticism that perhaps the normal was part of the problem all along. Now, I'm interested, there are thousands, of, in fact, millions of headlines like this, and I'm interested in the cultural work that the word normal is doing here, the intense cognitive and affective shock that this repetition of the word normal is in fact an index of. Now, I'm interested in this in the context of the medical humanities because the word normal is one that originally derives from a medical context and in, in its original meaning, it meant something like healthy. If we go to the next slide, my colleague Peter and Kryle and I um, examined this in our recent book on the history of normality, which shows how in the middle of the last century, just after the Second World War, this idea of the normal as healthy merged with a newer idea of the normal as a uh, derived from statistics to mean average. And the consequence of this we see in my final slide, um, which are two public health statues uh, exhibited widely just after the Second World War. And they're called Norma and Norman because they are both representations of good health, but the average young American male or female. I show these because they make visible what is unsaid about this word, the normal that's so central to discourse at the moment, that it's very white, that it's very able-bodied and that it's very heterosexual. And they reveal to us the extent to which this word normal is not a terribly inclusive category of indigenous people, of people with disabilities, of sexually and gender diverse people um, are all excluded from uh, cultural stereotypes of the idea of the normal. 
So this anxiety about the normal we're having now um, is a good uh, opportunity to reflect on how medical ways of think, seeing and thinking have broad and sometimes unrecognised cultural effects and what is at stake in recognising that. Karen, did you want to finish off with anything? Well, I mean, one of the things that is really interesting here is uh, like the, the, the way we're talking about how to get back to the normal and how we, how there's become an emphasis on, on, on uh, what we're doing to get back to the normal and what we're doing to combat the crisis. And I think that's, that's actually one of the things that, that I don't feel has been critiqued enough in, in, the, in, in, in the various kind of responses to the corona crisis. Uh, this this emphasis on doing and when and when when people talk about like how good certain countries are in their response, they count the amount of things that that country has done to uh, to to combat the crisis, and that kind of idea of doing is very simplistic, and uh, and um, I mean it's, it's again one of the things that's come up a lot in the in the Swedish response to it that sometimes doing something can be more harmful than not doing something. And it could actually lead to a greater crisis rather than a, a lesser, than a, than a, like kind of alleviate the things that are happening. And um, it, so I think there are some, several concepts here, the normal ideas of agency and ideas of doing that, uh, that need some further critique. Thank you very much, Karen and Elizabeth. Um, Fascinating talk and uh, and yes, again, all, all more thought provoking uh, content for us to uh, mull over. Um, I'm going to move on now to um, Dr. Beck Wise um, from the School of Communication and Arts. Um, and Beck is talking about policing the pandemic, rhetorics of protest and public health during COVID-19. Take it away, Beck. All right. Thank you, Kelly, for the introduction. And thank you to everyone on the stream for being here today. I pay my respects to the traditional owners of this land and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are watching this stream. We don't have a lot of time together today, so I'm limiting myself to three key ideas. What is medical rhetoric? How does it help us understand debates about health and justice? And what does that look like during COVID-19? So let's start at the beginning. Rhetoric is a field of study concerned with communication that informs, motivates, or classically persuades. Fundamentally, it investigates how symbolic communication operates in the world and what its effects are. Within this larger field, the rhetoric of health and medicine has emerged as an important transdisciplinary area, which investigates the intersections of symbolic communication with medical cultures, practices, and literacies, both inside and outside of medical institutions. So kind of bridging those two approaches to the medical humanities that Corinne spoke about. This is not an abstract field of study. It's one that's fundamentally concerned with action in the world and with issues of justice. James Wilson and Cynthia Lewicki Wilson note that scholars in the area extend rhetorical analyses beyond an immediate text to investigate the interconnections of language and material practice. In medical rhetoric, as Judy Siegel puts it, research projects aim to be useful, whether in asking questions that proceed or can inform the questions asked by health researchers and practitioners, or in asking questions that arise from current circumstances. And what we aim to do is to create projects that offer discursive and action-oriented pathways forward. So we have a classical focus on persuasion plus an emphasis on practical application. This combination positions us to help uh, understand deliberation, debate and decision making about questions related to health uh, and about these questions in technical, governmental and public spheres. For example, rhetoric and technical communication scholars have published on things like transnational pandemic communication during the SARS epidemic, patient self-advocacy for chronic and poorly understood conditions like the emerging category of COVID-19 long haulers, and tactical technical communication, instructions and documentation produced outside of institutions to support communities in their uh, different practices. So we might think here of the hand-washing meme generator, wash your lyrics. As teacher scholars, we also teach people how to make this kind of user and audience centered communication to create change in their communities. That's the big picture about what rhetoric can tell us and how it helps us understand discourse about health. Now let's look at one example from the current situation in Australia, the public health messaging and community media debate over COVID-19 risks at the recent Black Lives Matter protests. So here in Australia, early criticism of these events aligned along two axes. 
The first is that protests were organised despite public health orders banning large gatherings due to the risk of community transmission of COVID-19. The second axis is that the protests were prompted by police killings of black Americans in the US and so were not relevant to the Australian context. Although organisers consistently foregrounded the local issue of Aboriginal deaths in custody, even as they made links to global practices of anti-black violence. These two ideas represent competing public health imperatives. Participants in the protests had to use their own health literacy as they were asked to weigh up the relative health costs of community transmission of COVID-19 with those of ongoing police brutality. We've seen no evidence of COVID-19 transmission at any protests in Australia, although media commentators do continue to attempt to connect the Melbourne protest to the current Victorian outbreak. This uh, lack of transmission uh, is testament to the prevalence and effectiveness of mask wearing at this outdoor event. And indeed, it represents a success for both tactical technical communication, the educational material about mask effectiveness circulated by organisers, and a success for community health literacy, with protesters assessing disease risk uh, and acting, as was eventually shown, both responsibly and in the public interest. And I'll note as well that this mirrors the success of community-led responses to COVID-19 in Indigenous communities in Australia. I don't have time to develop a full argument about how and why Australian protesters chose to attend Black Lives Matter rallies in such significant numbers in the midst of a pandemic. But it is the kind of question that rhetoric can help us investigate and answer. And so I'll wrap up, it's a long wrap up, um, by gesturing towards some rhetorical concepts that describe the context and suggest some factors that may explain what influenced protesters' decisions to march en masse, protesting geographically and temporally distant killings in the face of a global pandemic. Most obviously, it's clear from advertising for the marches that organisers identified an opportunity for persuasive local action in the US's large-scale uprising. Rather than displacing Australia's excesses to the United States, organisers carefully aligned the two nations' policing practices, drawing an analogy between George Floyd's death in Minneapolis, whispering, I can't breathe, as his throat was crushed beneath Derek Chauvin's knee, and Ngadi man David Dungay's death, crying out, I can't breathe, as correctional officers held him face down on a bed. As black rhetorician Ursula Ore explains in her analysis of her own unlawful arrest on the university campus, where she's a full professor of rhetoric, uh, cries for aid in the face of police brutality typically go unanswered. I don't chat help, she says, because I know that assistance from others is not an option for black women in the street, particularly when those women are tussling with white men in blue uniforms. There are further analogies to be made in the way that pre-existing respiratory and cardiovascular conditions were presented as individual factors in the men's deaths, shifting blame from cops to victims, even though the effects of structural racism mean that such diseases are disproportionately common in Black American and Australian Indigenous communities, and so those conditions cannot be considered individual factors. COVID-19 health advice in Australia highlighted the effect of race on pandemic vulnerability, putting racist health disparities between white and Indigenous communities in daily view. And there's something too in the resonance of struggling for breath as a respiratory pandemic sweeps around the world. While the wall-to-wall -wall coverage of overwhelmed hospitals running out of ventilators has in Australia subsided, it's likely that the image of dying breathless and alone, institutionalised, strikes a little closer to home than it might in other times. These and other factors come together to what produce what we in rhetorical studies call a chirotic moment, an opening for communication to be crafted and delivered in a way that produces change. Precisely because medical rhetoric is a hybrid field, it allows us to see the way that concerns about policing, protest, racism and public health work together in this pandemic moment to facilitate and demand effective communication. It's this attention to possibility, persuasion and action that characterizes rhetorical studies and which constitutes rhetoric's contribution to understanding COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beck. Um, again, a uh, really interesting talk. And I'm in the interest of time, I'm going to forge straight ahead and hand over to Associate Professor Jane Johnston from the School of Communication and Arts, who's going to be talking about how COVID-19 is reframing how we think about the public interest. Over to you, Jane. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I just, um, before I start my 
seven minutes, I'd just like to um, acknowledge a point that um, Adrian made when he said social consensus has proved more effective than authoritative control, because that, that was a really nice segue into my paper. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm just going to read mine to a large extent to keep to time. Thank you. Um, okay, so as Australia was coming out of the so-called boom years of economic prosperity a decade ago, Australian economist Ross Garno proposed two possible options for the country. One was a private interest approach to business as usual in what, in what he called business, sorry, as, to business and society in what he called business as usual, driven largely out of vested interests and individualism. The other adopted a public interest focus, which, fa which favoured a national benefit and considered those less well off. Garno was not optimistic about achieving the latter. The odds favoured Australians choosing business as usual. But something happened. The COVID-19 pandemic hit. Governments everywhere were forced to make quick decisions. To some extent, it called for a back to basics model, which effectively called for a big hard look at what was needed in the public interest in quick time. The long-standing, deeply embedded mechanism for balancing the interests of people within democratic systems became the symbolic vehicle to move the country forward. First, and overarchingly, it happened with health. New laws and regulations to manage the virus escalated communitarian values at such a rapid rate that individual rights and interests were subsumed under community needs. You can go back one, please, um, slide mover. This slide comes later. Can you move the slide back, please? Thanks. Just leave that one till I ask to, to move on. Thank you. Um, the government um, and media rhetoric affirmed the policy position. We had to flatten the curve. It could be done by, it could only be done by staying at home and social distancing. We were, after all, all in this together. The key messages became mantras no longer just the governments, but a shared language that was arguably designed to help all stakeholders rebel, repel the common threat. COVID-19 has demanded a rethink of many things. One is the national interest and alongside it, how governments here and elsewhere are framing and managing what is seen to be in the public interest. It happened first with the gigantic challenges to managing the health of citizens and in close succession, the rollout of the international relations reform with unions and businesses um, agreeing to um, meet in the big tent of consensus. Flipping the paradigm that Garno predicted would continue to be dominated by the individual interests that had underpinned the good times of the boom years. ABC commentator David Spears called this a new spirit of harmony through a radically simple approach to industrial relations. Events that preceded COVID, notably the bushfires, and those that had been embedded within it, notably the Black Lives Matter protests, also consolidated this humanitarian uh, thinking, albeit often rejecting the government rhetoric. If we could go to the next slide now, thanks. That'd be great. Public interest theory um, uh, is, can be broken into a, broadly uh, five typologies. These uh, provide framing around how we imagine the public interest and how we see it connected to real world behaviour. Broadly, I and others have categorised the public interest in the following ways, as normative theories uh, based on the understandings of the general good of society, as process theories, which can take several forms, but the most instructive is the procedural approach, which sees the public as a process of compromise and accommodation based on multiple or pluralistic publics as aggregative, the sum of individual interests, the aggregative model, seeing the um, public interest equating with an alternative to government interests, as consensualist theories, which incorporate a communitarian approach, accepting basic rules of political conduct and politics of um, democratic, principles of democratic society. And finally, the abolitionist theories, which deny the idea of the public interest as an idea ghost, because it is neither empirically measurable nor achievable, because there can be no single public interest. Public interest theory has tended to favour the process and pluralistic approaches. Many publics, many interests that need to be considered in the postmodern, post-truth world. Societies are, after all, heterogeneous and pluralistic. However, the discourse surrounding COVID-19 has brought a new inflection to the public interest with a shift to a more communitarian centred and aggregative approach 
and the role interests play in the public psyche. Illustrative of this was the Industrial Relations Roundtable called in June, described by David Spears as unions and business coming together in cooperation, also described in the headline as courting consensus. We could go to the next slide, thank you. In an insider's program, David Spears asked the Saturday paper um, journalist, Karen Middleton, how significant was it that unions and employers were planning to sit around a table together and look at problems in the system? Middleton responded, it's very significant and it's only happening because of the pandemic. Clever on the part of government, she said, the union's whole mod modus operandi is collective action. Middleton further commented, the pandemic and bushfires have taught us what we can achieve together. We can, we can have, sorry, we can have small changes in behaviour to achieve something big. Also in the same program, the Attorney General and Minister for Industrial Relations, Christian Porter, put it this way. We're in extraordinary circumstances and the challenges we face to grow our way out of the economic damage of the pandemic has caused are just colossal. So there's a coalescence of interests for the first time in a long time. The game has changed. This was emblematic of a shift in thinking, the shift being on consensus and community as well as process. What Pietzka and I called in a recent book, Interest Forming Practices. It was essentially the combination of the Attorney General and union boss, Sally McManus, in what's been called an odd couple truce that saw the creation of job keeper and job seeker. The next slide, thank you. Finally, the Black Lives Matter protest, described by the New York Times as possibly the largest social movement in US history. The protest collided, collided beg your pardon, with, other, with this other watershed moment, the most de de devastating pandemic in modern history. The New York Times reported how arguably the catalyst of the video of the killing of George Floyd amplified in the dual context of people being at home and having time on their hands and nothing to, and not so much to do, contributed significantly in bringing people to action, not only in the US, but elsewhere, including in Australia. Stanford University professor Douglas McAdam said, it looks for all the world like these protests are achieving what very few do, setting in motion a period of significant, sustained and widespread social political change a tipping point that is rare in, as, uh, rare in society as it is potentially consequential. These events are seeing a rethink of public interest. While I acknowledge that civil rights and liberties have undoubtedly been the casualty of some activity surrounded COVID, not least of which occurring to vulnerable peoples, such as those in the Melbourne Towers, business as usual appears to have been ir irrevocably reset. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jane, and thank you to all of the speakers in the public interest theme. Now, <clears throat> I, I can't see that there are any um, questions coming through as yet, but it would be really fantastic if you could uh, send through your questions for the speakers. Um, in the meantime, you'll just have to listen to my, uh, my the, the things that went through my head as I was listening to the speakers. And one of the things that um, uh, struck me, Beck, as a connection between your talk and the talk of um, uh, Karen and uh, Elizabeth, um, who, you know, especially Elizabeth, but Karen uh, also um, talked about this idea of the, the normal and the new normal. And you talked about the sort of Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter in the face of, you know, that sort of discourse that, that um, was about, you know, whether or not people should protest given, you know, um, the, the health situation. And I, I wondered whether um, one of the things that was happening there is that, you know, that, that because people, you know, because there is this kind of constant, you know, talk about the new normal, that essentially it was opening up in people's minds the idea that protest would have a greater uh, chance of having an impact, you know, because we are in this changing world, um, this world of the new normal. And so a protest, you know, there's a kind of window of opportunity that's opening up there. And I just wondered whether um, any of you wanted to comment on that. That was just something that kind of um, popped into my head as I was listening to your talks. Yeah, look, I, I would say absolutely that's possible. Um, I don't think we can overlook the fact that the protests in the US, um, while they have kind of a large scale, uh, a sweeping scope, 
um, they are part of a very long trajectory of protests um, and respond to escalating conditions, uh, certainly since 2015, 2016. Um, you know, these are not new problems by any stretch of the imagination. And as Elizabeth said, you know, one of those emerging uh, discussions is around the way that uh, the old normal has been shown to be both uh, unjust, uh, um, oppressive to many people, um, and to exclude people from um, participation. The new, you know, many of the responses that we've seen to the pandemic have revealed that a lot of things people have been asking for for a long time are in fact possible. Mm. Great. And um, I see that there is a question, sorry, I missed this one before, and I think this is probably one for um, Karen. Is there an indication that the use of masks is perceived as not only a sign of solidarity, but that of compliance silencing? Fascinating question. What do you think? Very interesting. Uh, compliance silencing. I mean, I think actually in Sweden, uh, wearing a mask was almost became the opposite <laughs> because uh, because it became uh, it became a matter of standing up to the, the the daily the daily advice that was being given because uh, up till about um, it's about two weeks ago now finally uh, the, the scientific uh, leadership have said okay wearing a mask is probably a good idea but up till then uh, that they, they were very they were very adamantly uh, opposed to it so if anything, wearing a mask was showing that you didn't quite uh, agree with the policy that was that was what, that was being uh, that was being forged. So um, I mean, it's, it's a really interesting question. I think it, it comes to mean something very different in different kind of national contexts and in different in, in different kind of political spheres as well. Yeah, they, I mean, what we're seeing is a kind of politicization to some extent of the sort of mask wearing, aren't we? You know, because because of what's been happening in the US and the resistance on the part of some people to the idea of, you know, either mandating or even um, wearing masks for sure. Absolutely. Um, Emily, I thought there was another question here on the Q&A, which um, seems to have disappeared. I'm not sure how that's happened or whether the person themselves has taken it down. Um, so anyway, but I, I will... Um, uh, Jane, I wanted to just follow up your talk, which I think is really fascinating to think about. Um, you know, I suppose what I took from your um, um, your talk is that you know this this kind of fo this new focus on the public interest could be a real step in the right direction. Have I understood you correctly in that way? Is that the way you think about it, or or am I just being too kind of Pollyanna-ish or or? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it, look, it's tricky. And as I, I said at the end, definitely with the caveat that individual rights have, have you know, been lost in many instances at the expense of, of public interest. But what I've, and I haven't done any sort of quant study of this, which I'd be interested to do as I'll keep moving forward in that space. But I think that there is potential to, uh, there's a, a, a significant likelihood that what is being driven is not being driven from the government. It came from the government first through the, the, re, the, the propaganda posters, basically, and so forth. But people are taking it on board. And I mean, we saw that with, with Black Lives Matter, that there was this overwhelming response um, where did how that came out of the, the COVID situation, I don't think anyone's entirely clear, but there seemed to be a focus um, that, that really, I think, uh, because people are, incredibly focused at what is necessary for the public good, for public interest, for um, representing minorities, for thinking about things in a more specific kind of focused way, I think. I think COVID has just represented, a, COVID is a, has been a time for people to stop and take stock. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is a significant, we hope that there might be something that comes out of it that has more of a communitarian Focus. Certainly Australia has seen a bit more of that. The individualism that we've seen represented um, in the United States, which is of course much more embedded in their political system, um, has you know, probably not represented that in the same way. I'd be interested to talk to Karen about what she's found with um, uh, the situation um, in Sweden, because I think there's another, another layer there too. And I think different countries will have different takes from this. Um, but I do think that there are some, some interesting, are certainly some interesting um, 
developments that definitely governments should be looking at picking up and, and developing themselves. Well, I think, you know, there's two things that I thought, you know, because you're talking about the kind of national cabinet and how much I think that that's something that people have seen very positively. But I think you raised a really interesting point that's been striking me about the Swedish situation. And that is that I think of Sweden as a very sort of communitarian country. So it's interesting to see such a kind of, I think almost, well, what appears to me perhaps an individualistic approach to COVID, which says it's up to you. Um, and so, I mean, the way it's been kind of talked about that I've seen in the media is this sort of sense of, well, it's a kind of matter of, tr we trust you as a population to do the right thing. Um, and so maybe the, the, that is the reflection of the communitarian is that, you know, we're all in this together. And of course, we don't have to force you to do stuff because we trust that you will do that, do the right thing. But I, I, don't, I don't know, is, is that the right interpretation of the approach, um, Karen? Well, I mean, I think, I think in order to fully understand what's going on in Sweden, you have to take account of, of the way the Swedish kind of relationship to government functions in the first place. Because there's, there's, uh, there's kind of a code of trust that's there, uh, that's there in the very basis of, 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 uh, of, of the Swedish democracy. I mean, the, the Swedish people rely on the government to always do the right thing for them. And the government relies on Swedish people to be, to be loyal, to be, I mean, solidarity. Uh, there's, there's, there's a number of different like uh, words for solidarity in Sweden. It's, it's a, and there's adjectives for, for being solidarious. Um, and and it's it's a very important part of your thinking, but they but 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 it, it's kind of based on an idea that it's your responsibility to be uh, to 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 take part in solidarity and to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And when it comes down to it, I mean, obviously, there's been a lot of problems with the Swedish approach. There's, there's been a lot of glitches, and they they kind of didn't. They didn't count on, um, they had a very idealistic uh, idea of how people function and how the Swedish population functions. But um, I mean, when it came to, when they said to the Stockholmers, because that was the main, the main epicenter of the, of the pandemic around March, April, when they said to the Stockholmers uh, that they weren't allowed to leave the city, um, I mean, there, were n there was no enforcing, there was no police. Uh, but they they tracked everyone's mobile phones, and apparently 95% of the Stockholmers actually stayed in Stockholm. So that says quite a bit about the Swedes, even though, uh, I, and I don't think that could have been done anywhere else. You know, uh, I think I think it's a very specifically Swedish uh, kind of idea of how you relate to government. And for them, it would have been it would have been. I mean, I, when I've been talking about the Australian approach, they think it's absolutely unthinkable that that to take away the kind of civil rights that 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 are being taken away in Australia I mean all of my all of my family and friends keep sending me messages at the moment saying oh poor you having arrived in that police state <laughs> <laughs> um, they, I mean they for them it's 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 just a way of being that um, that that just does not correspond with the way they see government which I think is really, it's really fascinating to make those kind of. Mm -hmm. That is really fascinating. Elizabeth, just one last question before we move on to the next section. I am absolutely fascinated by your work about the normal and, you know, finding out that the, the term normal is a relatively recent phenomenon, right? And so, you know, that's really interesting to think about when you, when you see how ubiquitous it is in the way that we think about the world that we live in and about the world we're about to live in. And I, I suppose, um, you know, I wondered whether you might riff a little bit more about this kind of, this use of that new normal. Is that, I want, like, I think to me, it seems like a good thing because, you know, it's an opportunity for the world to be a better place, like, like a greener place. I think Greg sort of mentioned that in the beginning, but, you know, maybe, maybe not everyone feels that way. I don't know. What, what do you reckon? Yeah, so I know I'm mindful of the time as well, and that's a big question. But the question is, like, what is the word, what is the adjective new doing in there? And if, if we have a new normal that looks like some version of the old normal, are, are we back in the situation that a lot of people think we should take the opportunity to move out of? So recently, there's been a lot of um, articles, some of them very widely cited, about the fact that we should use this moment of crisis and chaos that's befallen us to leave the normal behind, what 
was normal and move, take the opportunity to move into a different space. That, that isn't something you'd call the new normal, that's something new. <laughs> the word normal drops out. My, my interest um, about the word normal is not to tell people that they should or should not be invested in, in ideas of normal. I'm interested in the fact that it's so persistent and the thing that, that fascinates me most about it is we think that the normal describes something that's you know uh, very conventional or a status quo but we see there was a lot of talk about the normal during the last American um, presidential campaign as well the time that everyone starts talking about the normal isn't when everyone knows what it is it's when it's in crisis it's a word that only appears to the level that I've shown with those headlines when the idea is in crisis so I'm interested in the diagnostics of that what is it about this moment that puts this idea in crisis and if we develop an idea of a new normal what hidden baggage are we bringing along with that there is so much discussion um, particularly by indigenous people in Australia by black people people of color in the state saying what is happening now this level of crisis a crisis and chaos has been our normal for sometimes centuries now so so you people who are so upset <laughs> about the the chaos of everyday life at the moment this is what life has been like for us for a really long time so I see it as a moment of, of, of assessment of what what values come along with those sort of ideas yeah that's a great point so we only kind of really take note use it and take notice of it when it's kind of when it's actually being challenged look thank you so much for um some really great ideas i think were presented um and and uh you know lots of food for thought uh, in those um those talks just then um i i am we are running a bit behind time but that's okay uh, because i'm pretty sure we can still fit into our um our uh, designated time slot. So um, I'd like to launch in now to the final theme, which is about the um, industry focus. Uh, and uh, I will start um, by handing over to Dr. Caroline wilson Bonneo from the School of Communication and Arts, who's going to talk about uh, museums and COVID-19 supporting the community during disruptive times. So take it away, Caro. Thanks, Kelly. I'll just... Uh... I just need, uh, I think maybe you stop your share so I can share screen. Hi everyone, um, my name is Caroline and um, my research focuses on museum digitization. Uh, and so for the past few months, um, like everyone else, I suppose, I, um, I have been following COVID and its impact in particular on cultural institutions and how they've been pivoting um, their activities in response to the pandemic. Without a doubt, COVID-19 has been uh, significant and it's had significant implications for museums globally, um, with the UNESCO reporting that about 13% of museums will never reopen. Despite this, museums have been responding in a range of ways, and that often involves providing um, tangible support to frontline workers. So, for example, the Museum of Modern Arts donated face masks and gloves to be used in hospitals in New York City. Other institutions have transformed their gardens to provide food for food banks. However, what's really interesting me, to me is that uh, COVID-19 has forced many institutions to um, reconsider their interactive and uh, participatory practices. The please touch me model that's characterized the museum over the last decade is changing as institutions are adopting new safety protocols. Museums must and they will look different upon reopening. I think it's fair to say that the coronavirus has accelerated the turn towards digitization that's been taking place for some time in museums. Today, I'm going to argue that despite the challenges that museums continue to face, that they play a vital role in the global response to the pandemic, both in terms of contributing to our understanding of it and in helping society as it transitions forward. Museums matter. They help to anchor our concepts of history, culture and livability, of public investment and of shared responsibility. And because museums by their very nature are concerned 
and with the provision of community access and representation, they can provide safe places for people to connect with each other and with objects. According to the International Council of Museums, museums by their very definition are non-profit permanent institutions in the service of society and its development. I'm not saying that museums aren't, uh, aren't always right or that they're always neutral. Sometimes they get it wrong. My intention then today is to present two key ways that museums are helping the communities in which they operate. This involves how they've maintained digital access to collections while their doors have been shut. And the second, the role these institutions have played in documenting the pandemic. Reflecting back on my first point, the museum has long been working to embed itself within online everyday spaces. That's not to say that all countries and institutions have a digital infrastructure. In fact, around 5% of institutions don't have any digital infrastructure. However, broadly speaking, the digitization strategies of museums have gained greater importance as a result of the pandemic. Culture after all can help communities live with pain and loss as a result of the coronavirus and connect people during isolation. This means that museums are starting to think about their visitors as more than the people who walk through their doors but as online users who are accessing them from anywhere in the world. The Rubin Museum of Art in New York is streaming a Tibetan shrine room and has developed their uh, other online resources to help alleviate stress and foster peace of mind during the trauma. Similarly, Te Papa Museum in New Zealand has launched the Little Page of Calm that's a site where people can complete an online jigsaw puzzle or watch the sunrise as a form of therapy. The digital museum can enhance access to knowledge and it can insist the institution in its desire to act as a source of inspiration, connection and information. My second and final point is that museums are actively collecting in order to develop an account of everyday life during the pandemic. That means that signs warning people to stay 1.5 metres apart, face masks and door openers, for example, have gained greater importance as artefacts in their own right. In Australia, institutions such as Museum Victoria have launched Collecting the Curve. This involves documenting medical research and public health responses to the pandemic. Similarly, the National uh, Museum of Australia uh, in Canberra has launched a digital initiative to provide a national platform to record shared experiences. Greater focus is also being paid on getting people to describe the experience of isolation and their fears um, and their anxieties. In summary, the purpose of my talk today has been to provide an overview of some of the many ways that museums have been working to serve the public interest. You might say that while the museum collects objects, they actively seek out ways to operate as a community resource that also helps society remember the things that can be easily forgotten. A resource that many of us have been in a fortunate position of taking for granted. So while we stop to recognise the important work of medical professionals and essential workers, the role of the museum should not be overlooked. Instead, the museum might be regarded as a space that links people with places and values that are not their own. A deeply radical place that displays collections for the public benefit. But globally and locally, we're seeing museums are cutting back on programs, operating hours, acquisitions and staff in response to the pandemic. This time of turmoil, highlights the importance of the museum in maintaining social resilience and community well-being. Thank you. Thanks very much, Caro. That was um, that was great. Not not least of all because now we know where to go and do a, a, an online jigsaw or get the calm. <laughs> so uh, so really interesting and some good tips. 
Um, so I think we have time really for you know, maybe one kind of really quick question um, uh, to uh, Caro uh, and Natsuko. If there are any burning questions, um, please, please do send them through. Otherwise, again, it'll be a matter of uh, uh, me um, uh, randomly asking things that popped into my head as I was listening to them. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I do think, I, mean, I think these were great talks to finish off with because, uh, you know, they really sort of, you know, talk about that sort of concrete impact on you know, the world that we're living in and, and these sort of institutions that we take for granted. Um, Caro, I think one of the things that I have noticed, um, you know, is, is that, you know, we've gone from kind of thinking all of our meetings have to be face to face to fully accepting that, you know, we can do this sort of online Zoom kind of catch-ups. And I'm wondering whether this is, um, and it sounds like what you're saying is that this is really what's going to happen in the museum space, is that this is a kind of fast tracking of something that was already starting to happen. And so probably it, you know, it really brings to the fore for these institutions that, you know, we need to think about this more or invest more or, um, you know, you know it, it makes it seem more important to them to sort of forge ahead with that pathway. Is that is that right? I, yeah, I think you're correct. The term has been happening for some time, that model of person to person, more, that more performative model. And, and, and again, a lot of it overlap between Natsuko's talk and my own, that model of person to person or live is shifting. Um, and that's been happening for some time in regard to the sector, but I think um, it's being propelled, of course, by COVID. But the other thing that's propelling it along is actually the financials, which is just the fact that um, there's just less money for public institutions and our understanding of their public role is changing and there's a push towards privatisation of the sector. So, which, uh, which is changing actually this kind of understanding of the public role of these institutions, I suppose, and begs larger questions about, I suppose, linking to Jane's talk earlier about the public interest and our understanding of the public interest. Thanks, Cara. And Natsuka, I'm sorry not to be able to kind of explore in more detail your talk, which was um, fascinating. I loved, I loved those um, images that you showed of from the um, the Spanish flu. You know, the I think you sort of said this is, you know, um, uh, previously, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of social media from the past. I guess uh, they were they were um, beautiful images. Look, I'm I, I do have to cut it off there, and I, I do apologize. Guys, um, that uh, we don't have more time for discussion, um, and, uh, and but hopefully these are the beginning of conversations and the beginning of research programs that will be going forward, and we'll all be hearing much more about this research in the future. Um, and what I'd like to do in the last few minutes um, that we have left is hand back over to Associate Professor Jane Johnston um, to really um, just um, do the thank yous and the, the summing up. So Jane, handing back over to you right now. Thanks, Kelly, and thanks for doing such a great job of emceeing. Um, thank you to the amazing lineup of scholars that attended today and sharing your research. The breadth and scope of the scholarship here has been um, amazing, demonstrating just how relevant the humanities are um, for unpacking the seemingly overwhelming crisis of COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic. The humanities provide insights for all fields, through examining everything from health and media and museums to policy and philosophy, without which our society would be a poorer and far less informed one. Today's event was made possible by the incredible support and expertise of our marketing communication alumni and event team here at UQ. So thank you to uh, Sophie Rutledge and Weston Brunner, to Emily Steve, um, Sievers who, who ensured the webinar ran smoothly and especially to Olivia Brown from the School of Communication and Arts, who seamlessly and expertly managed the event from the beginning. For anybody who um, is interested in following up to look at the talks, they will be uh, available on the Has YouTube um, site in a couple of days. Um, and in a timely fashion, um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Wish you all a happy weekend and, uh, uh, and um, a, a healthy future in the COVID space. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jane, for having the great idea to put this together. And so um, 
uh, you know, wonderful, I think, uh, impetus, uh, especially at the moment where we need to, um, to demonstrate, I think, more than ever, the importance and the relevance of uh, the humanities. So I think it's a terrific event. And um, yeah, and thanks everyone for attending. And um, oh, I think the only other thing, did you say, Jane, maybe you said it already about the, um, it would be up on the um, Hass. Um, yeah, okay, you said that. Sorry, YouTube channel. Wonderful. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thanks a lot. See you later. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.